We just heard about a very nice talk about uh, um, DNA uh, effects or, or due to radiation for treatment. And I will be talking right now about preventing these, these effects. So in, in a regular situation, physiological situation, uh, my, we are interested in uh, prevent the formation of uh, in reactive oxygen species and all these indirect effects we just heard about. So I will be talking about cellular detoxification and the relation of this with iron metabolism. So uh, we, uh, it, ROS, or reactive oxygen species, are not new for, for all of us, so they uh, can be formed uh, by exposure to ionizing radiation. Uh, they also can be the results of leaking on the respiratory chain. So if we have electrons or uh, free electrons in an aerobic uh, environment, uh, we can generate those species or we can uh, uh, just have in the metabolism as a response to the immune systems. So the chemical re reactions we have involved here are Fenton and Aber wise <coughs> reactions, and uh, uh, in the presence, which results from the reaction of iron species uh, in an aerobic environment. So if we have ferrous or ferric uh, ions uh, uh, reacting with uh, peroxide, hydrogen peroxides, we can generate these reactive oxygen species which are very reactive and can uh, generate uh, a lot of cellular damages, namely in proteins, DNA, lipids, all, all cellular structures. So what we want to do now is to try to prevent the formation of these species in a cell, uh, in a regular or normal physiological conditions, and uh, try to prevent those damages. So just try, uh, uh, cells develop lots of different uh, systems to prevent this, this damage, namely uh, systems that involve proteins, systems that involve sequestration of metal ions, or just uh, some small molecules that uh, just trap and uh, basically remove these species from, from the environment. Just, uh, uh, we'll be focusing focus on, on trying to understand how can we s remove ferrous ion and ferric iron from solutions and uh, try to remove those species from solution, namely hydrogen peroxide. Uh, so the question is, there are any systems that can just do this in, in the same reaction? Just before going to those, to, to those systems, I just, I just would like to review some basic uh, iron chemistry. Uh, is first of all a uh, metal of the transition, uh, uh, transition metal of the first row, uh, is stable in, the, or is most stable in the, the first uh, state, but in the present transition, it will just uh, be converted into the ferric state. The problem is that it's very uh, soluble uh, uh, to try to find, to concentrate and keep the iron uh, ions away from, from the oxygen. Um, so in summary, in cells, in an aerobic physiological pH, iron will, will exist mainly as insoluble, solid, uh, uh, form, means iron hydroxides, um, which does not make metal available for cells. But all of us know that it's essential for cell. It's all, and if we look to these purple boxes of the periodic, periodic table, we see that iron is, an essential, is essential for humans. So we have a way to keep iron available without of these species in the presence of oxygen. So uh, what cells have, have uh, produced are many, many systems, enzymatic systems, all of, no, uh, all of us know catalases, superoxid dismutases, but also ferritins. Uh, 
Uh, ferritin is a protein that is present in all, all uh, um, uh, organisms, from aerobic to anaerobic ones. So what is the function, function of this protein? It's to concentrate iron inside the uh, inner cavity, is to detoxify iron, which means that is to remove iron from the solution and preventing the reaction with hydrogen peroxide, for instance. Uh, also, the reaction with oxygen and then precipitation of the metal is to remove hydrogen peroxide also from uh, and very recently, uh, the DNA protection function of these proteins was also demonstrated. In this picture, we have uh, an iron solution in aerobic conditions without ferritin and with ferritin. And as you can see, in the right tube, there is no precipitation. And in the left tube, there is the precipitation of iron as uh, rest, basically. Um, just a, a, a very quick review types of ferritin uh, based on the composition of the protein. Maxiferritin that has a total molecular weight of around 480 kilodaltons that is by 24 subunits or mini ferritins that are about half of the former ones. So uh, although the primary sequence of the proteins are not uh, equal, identical, they share the same 3D structure. So they keep as the same functions. So if we now look at to the maxiferritin structure, uh, this uh, protein is called archetypal because it's the one that is most present in most organisms from eukarya to prokaryotes. Uh, they are composed by 24 subunits, and they, these subunits are assembled in such a way that they generate channels. For instance, here, it's the junction of four subunits, each subunit is presenting in green, and in the middle we have a channel, a channel that allows the iron to entry and to exit uh, of the cell necessity on this metal. Uh, the protein is a, has a, a, an outer diameter of about 12 nanometers and an inner diameter of uh, 8 nanometers. And as you can see, we just uh, remove the protein is a, a sphere, a hollow sphere uh, that contains a, a, a cavity inside where the iron, oxidized iron, is kept uh, in a solid form. So uh, the red surface uh, represents the, the negatively charged amino acids, and these, these are the ones that interact with the iron species and keep them in the cavity. They will be moved uh, um, depending on the, on the necessity of the cell on iron. In mammalian type uh, of ferritin subunits, the H and the L subunits, the H uh, is the L one, L is the one. They really do not differ much uh, from each other, but they differ on the L subunit dominates on proteins that are produced tissues that do not require much iron, uh, and they are named slow ferritins. And H subunits predominate on proteins that uh, are produced in heart and the brain, for instance, uh, where do they need uh, much more iron, and also they are more, uh, they have oxygen, higher oxygen levels. They are named fast ferritins because they have the functions of to remove the from solution. Um, and they, they do this uh, because they all contain a dinuclear that catalyzes this reaction. If we zoom one 
units represented here by four helix, helix alpha helix, we can see uh, the, the site where iron binds, named uh, ferroxidase site, because it's in this site that the fast reaction or fast oxidation reaction of iron is, uh, takes place. Basically, we have uh, amino acids uh, with side chains with oxygen or nitrogen that rapidly bind these ions. Uh, if we now look to the structures, depending on, on the origin of, of uh, the, the organisms, we can have a dinuclear iron site, or in bacteria, we have an extra third iron site. Okay, and I should mention here that this cofactor is not a classical cofactor because in protein cofactors are part of the protein. In this case, no, well, the protein uh, just uh, uh, provides the ligands to the, to, in this case, to the metal site, and then the catalysis will start. So the first step on the catalysis will be the ligation of the ferrous ions to these sites, A, B, and C in the case of bacteria. We have been working on, on the establishing of the catalytic mechanism of iron oxida oxidation, fast iron oxidation, because we want to understand how cells remove the iron from solution and also, in some case, react these ions with hydrogen peroxide. So we want to know how ions in solution goes to inside the cavity uh, where a solid mineral is formed. What are the intermediates? What is the chemistry involved? So we've been using uh, an array of techniques from biochemical, molecular biology, and spectroscopic techniques, namely uh, rapid kinetic methods, namely UV visible and free uh, associated to several spectroscopies, Mossbauer, EPR, resonance from and EXAFs, always with the aim of uh, characterizing the iron species and the kinetics associated with each so in 97, we were the first ones to identify the first oxidized intermediates, which is a diferic peroxo species. So two iron uh, uh, ions bound to an oxygen but, uh, through a bridge. Uh, for, such, for such identification and characterization, we use MOS power, visible resonance, and uh, exafs. So uh, basically, the Im image I have here is a MOS power spectrum that allows us to follow all types of iron species. Uh, contrary to the other techniques, we, here we can see all oxidation states of iron. So mainly here we have a peak that to the ferrous iron, which is the substrate, and then we have the, the other uh, doublet, MOS power doublet, that corresponds to this first intermediate. So we can follow kinetics. This uh, decreasing line corresponds to the oxidation, or the disappearance of further science. And this line that builds up and then disappears corresponds to the first inter intermediate, this diferic peroxo species. So he is built up upon uh, uh, ferrous oxidation, and then we'll be converting into another species that we were also able to characterize. Then we moved to uh, another system, which is try to understand the third site in bacterial ferritins. This, this protein is again a ferritin, but is only present in bacteria. So beside the two iron sites that were named A and B, we have a third one, which is named C. And until very recently, uh, recently nobody really knew what was the role of this site, site C, on the catalysis. And the proposed model, model at the time, was that it will be involved 
on the translocation of the iron, oxidized iron, into the cavity, uh, the inner cavity of the protein. So again, we use a set of uh, method, methods, spectroscopic, biochemical, molecular biology methods, uh, and we were able to prove that in bacteria, uh, this site is very important and participates on the fast oxidation of iron. So instead of having a dinuclear iron site, we can have a trinuclear. So the reaction sh should be faster. This particular protein reacts with hydrogen per peroxide faster or more efficiently than with oxygen. So it's a way that bacteria found to remove two toxic species from solution, in thus preventing uh, uh, formation of reactive oxygen ones. We, we, were, we worked a lot on this project and we were able to publish on JEX, which, is, which was very good uh, for us. And uh, I think we changed a little bit the proposed model. And, and meanwhile, we were uh, we've been w still working on this, this project because we do not have the model, the catalytic mechanism established. We have been also working on another protein, which is bacteriferritin. It's a maxiferritin, but is very similar to the former one, but still have an extra cofactor, which is a heme group between each dimer, each uh, two subunits. And we already know that this in group does not have a role on the fast oxidation reaction, but probably on the releasing of the iron from the So uh, we've been working, and meanwhile, we just find that uh, this protein behaves as a DNA protecting protein. Which was, which was not, never described for ferritin. So we did some EMSA assays, and we proved that the protein binds DNA, protecting him. So if you see, uh, if we react DNA with an endonuclease, the protein, the enzyme, will not cleave the DNA. So as a DNA protection function, and also, if we expose DNA to iron and iron peroxide, that will uh, uh, convert them into radicals, free radicals that completely damage the DNA, that will not happen if we have bacterial ferritin. Okay? So, we were able to prove that this protein does catalyze the, the iron oxidation and at the same time protects DNA. So I would just like to finish uh, with the acknowledgement. Uh, we have a collaboration with uh, the Portuguese group with uh, an American group, mainly lead, the leadership is Vincent Wynn uh, from Atlanta, uh, Emory University. We also work with Elizabeth Till uh, also from United States on the mammalian uh, ferritin. So I would like to thank you, all of you. Thank you, Elise, very much for this talk on biochemical reactions and the role of iron. So time for questions, please, or comments. somehow use this protein as a, as a shield in a molecular or in a biological environment after irradiation? Or how does this protein behave in an environment where 
would say that the cell that we don't want to talk to me to not be radiation or at least to say as much as we can. I don't know. Yeah, well, with protein, the irradiation of proteins is kind of, uh, we will see on the papers told that uh, will generate damage to the protein itself. So, uh, depending on the doses, the protein may be just damage. It's one of the effects we are main. I think nowadays, it's quite uh, a situation of the tumor. Uh, probably it's not uh, only the damage on the DNA, but also on the proteins that should protect DNA. So, uh, if, if in, I, in an ideal situation, yes, these proteins could protect the DNA, for instance, uh, from the indirect effect effects, right? from all the radical species that are produced from water and radiolysis. Yes. Okay, so iron is always present, yes. no matter if it's a, 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 no matter which sort of cell we're talking about, either cancer cell or yes. yeah. uh, let's say normal cells. Yes. So, so the role of iron can be somehow by um, controlling this flux or role of iron within a cell, <coughs> would that be possible to somehow induce? Yes. There, there's no free iron in a cell, so you have to remove it in any way because, uh, well, I'm talking about aerobic cells, like for instance humans, okay? So there is no free iron because it will readily precipitate, it will be rust in a cell, so you, nobody wants rust in a cell. So uh, it, it has to be removed very, very quickly. Okay. So the protein has this function. Of course, in a cell you have all the other ones that everybody talks about, catalases, superoxidase mutases, glutathione peroxidases, all of them. But those ones all only remove hydrogen peroxide, superoxide anions. Uh, uh, so they are not focused or they are not involving the iron. And the iron is the most efficient catalyst for uh, uh, reactive oxygen species. So do we know anything about when we radiate the cell and uh, how does that change the balance of this? Uh, well, we do not have anything about this protein, but we have in another one that is involved, uh, and Pedro will, will be talking about, in involved on DNA damage repair. Those, those mechanisms that Kevin just mentioned about, the, the uh, mechanism that prevent uh, damage of DNA, and we know that the radiation just destroy the protein. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very naive question. As well. <laughs> the, the obvious place where one knows about iron is the hemoglobin. Yes. What's the relationship between these ferritins and the hemoglobin? E hemoglobin uh, has just the function of transport, transporting the oxygen. What's the interaction between them? There's iron mm -hmm. in both, and they must exchange mm -hmm. their iron. Uh, no, they do not in interact in effect. Uh, they are just produced, uh, the produ production of them are um, tissue specific. You, uh, most of the hemoglobin is produced in uh, red cells, uh, red blood cells, and, and uh, these ferritins are not. But the problem is that this protein is the one that uh, makes iron available for hemoglobin to be assembled. Oh, so there are That's the related in, in the sense of uh, metabolic uh, production of the protein. Right. Okay, so I think we thank Elise. Okay, so I believe I have a problem now because I'm speaking before lunch, so I'll try to be fast, and then 
also it will be difficult to follow uh, both Kevin and the list, but I'll try to do my best. Um, so basically here, we're we trying to present two different views of um, the same source of uh, science, which is trying to figure out how proteins will either protect or prevent uh, DNA damage, and eventually how can we extrapolate to humans, for, in for instance, um, trying to predict or to have some clinical uh, prediction of the redox uh, state of so the oxidative stress uh, capability we have to deal with this species. And this slide is uh, slightly similar to what Elise was talking about. Uh, the question here is that these are all defenses and I uh, will in the first part of my talk um, try uh, to talk about when defenses fail and actually one of the slides that <coughs> Kevin had um, introduced the team the, the, the thematic of um, how to repair the errors. And I should uh, say that um, the errors can be induced or non-induced, uh, which means that there is a, um, an error that is prone to happen even without any, let's say, radiation, okay? Because it's normal, that's how things evolve anyway. So these this really, these systems are, um, interesting and very important. And uh, before going on, I'll, I'll just uh, try to, obviously probably all of you know, but there are different types of DNA damage and um, we'll be um, trying to figure it out if some of this damage can be monitored or not in the second part of the talk. Um, the direct or indirect damage obviously um, on DNA will cause things that are strange, bulky, and uh, for instance here I have a, a pair of uh, timings that are bound together as uh, usually happens, so I have dimers of timings in these reactions, so we do need a repair system. And um, this repair process exists in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes cells, and it involves a large number of proteins and enzymes. Um, so it's uh, not a simple process. Um, and there are different mechanisms um, by which the cell will respond. So uh, I will not go into the details of that, but um, I will focus um, on a particular uh, type of enzymes. And here I have different types, but the one I'm most interested in now, it will be these bare enzymes, the base excision repair enzymes, um, especially these endonucleases here. And they, you, what they do is simple. They, they go to the site that is damaged, they can recognize it, they remove the base, and then they don't stop there, usually at least the one that I will talk about, and they just make a nick on the, the, the double helix, and then the next enzymes, polymerases and ligases can come and repair the DNA and eventually uh, replace the damaged base. The enzyme that I, I will focus, uh, it's called endonuclease 3 and um, it's from E. coli. And we um, thought of using this as a model um, for um, one problem that um, Nowadays, this starts to coming a little bit more important, but is the fact that maybe, uh, and I know this might sound a little bit cruel to Paulo, but maybe DNA is not that important when damage is concerned, okay? Or at least it's important, but there are other things that are also important. And we learned about that, um, especially uh, because um, effects on different uh, types of uh, cell uh, particles induce some kind of um, damage. Um, this enzyme is particularly interesting for us because it was the first, and that's why we chose it, it was the first DNA glycosylate that shows up 
with the iron sulfur cluster. An iron sulfur cluster is a very normal structure in biology. Um, for those of you that do not know it, it's basically a, a, a cube, and in some corners you have irons, and this here in slightly red uh, are the irons, that are bound to four inorganic um, sulfurs, and then the whole assembled is connected uh, covalently bound to the protein by cysteines. This is a, a side chain of a uh, cysteine residue and it's covalently bound to the iron. So each iron is more or less a tetrahedral uh, bound by sulfurs. And they are involved in many, many um, uh, functions uh, from electron transfer to catalysis. And the best known example is probably a conitase which has um, a, a cluster which is involved in catalysis. So we, we, our thought was to figure it out if we can monitor the state of this center and uh, because it is essential to binding DNA, here there is a, a, a structure where you can find a um, double helix and this arm here is binding DNA and it's be, it will be responsible for the catalysis. Um, although the iron center, which is here, is actually responsible for maintaining this part of the protein functional. So if we do not have the iron there, we do not have a functional protein. That's why we are interested in monitoring the state of that iron cluster. And when we started this, and I put this slide here, because sometimes, and I guess most of you, um, we'll think that when we buy something, they give us what we buy. And as um, uh, Stephen told us, some com companies sell things, and I'm not, by no means, not addressing Sigma Aldrich, it's a very fine company, uh, but uh, we have to be careful because it depends, if, if you notice here, they say roughly over 90%, and we have to figure out sometimes what that means. Um, I took the time just to pick different prices depending on the audience, so I have also Australian dollars, and you can probably figure it out, it's a huge amount of money for 10 units of this enzyme. This comes in a very small file, okay? And we actually first bought it to figure out what they were selling, and um, unfortunately, most of the protein they sell does not have the cluster at all. So it has, uh, from the point of um, the person that is going to use that to have um, an activity, it's okay, because part of the thing they are selling does have activity. Um, but for us, it wouldn't do, because most of the protein probably does not have the cluster, so it would be uh, a non-homogeneous preparation. Um, and it would prevent us from doing research because I don't think we can do it at those prices at all. So um, we went back and we cloned the protein, we optimized expression, purification, we come to homogeneous preparations of uh, protein that are fully loaded with that cluster, and that, and that's very important to us, that we can do isotope uh, enrichment because if we want to use some kind of spectroscopy, and the list already showed uh, MOS power spectroscopy, for doing MOS power spectroscopy we need iron 57, as all the physicists in the audience know it's 2.2 percent, so one way of getting a nice uh, signal to noise uh, ratio is to enrich in iron 57. Cutting a long story short, um, we radiate the protein and we did this to start with with a UVC um, facility that is available here, nothing fancy. Um, we radiated the protein and um, we tried to figure it out first by visible, because this cluster has a visible spectrum, what happens. And um, we did lost uh, the band that is attributable. Uh, to, the, to the iron sulfur center, but unfortunately um, there is different extinction coefficients to, for different iron centers and we could be, um, 
when we see this, usually people will interpret this as destruction, but it's difficult to do that by visible because you can be converting something into another species. So while visible will tell you that something is happening, maybe it does not tell you what's happening for sure. And that's when we turn to MOS power, as at least I explained, we can see all iron in the sample, uh, regardless of the um, oxidation state and obviously coordination and state and all that. And we just took some points and um, here is when things get interesting because we have the non-irradiated protein and then, uh, and this is a typical uh, spectra for a for iron phosphor cluster. And then we have different irradiated uh, samples and you can see that um, some species start to develop and by the end of this uh, irradi irradiation time, in this case 120 minutes, we uh, converted um, the protein into a different form. And what this is, is not destructed protein, uh, I mean protein without cluster, without center. Actually, we are converting the 4 iron for uh, center into a different type of center. So it's losing either one iron or two irons, but it's still there. So what radiation is doing here is not destroying the protein, the polypeptide chain or something like that, although we do have some evidence that thyrosines in the protein can be damaged um, because of uh, fluorescence data that I'm not presenting. But nevertheless, what's mainly um, the radiation in this case, um, the irradiation with UV light is doing is creating a different type of cluster. And to be sure that we are not losing the iron um, and, and the protein at the same time, we just monitor uh, the protein state by a simple STS page. And if you can um, try to look at it, at lane two, we have no irradiation, and almost at till lane seven, you see the same thing. Lane seven is 45 minutes, and then you can see that you're losing something. There are some aggregates here, uh, but unless you go to 360 minutes um, of irradiation time, you still have the polypeptide chain intact. I mean, intact with the same molecular size. Okay, I have one minute. Okay, so in one minute, I'm going to explain what uh, uh, I would call it a quantum leap in another audience. Here, I'm afraid of doing so, but nevertheless, um, we thought, okay, we know something about this oxidative stress stuff in bacteria and also in mammalian proteins. Let's try to do something more applied because they are always nagging us about money and applying our science and all that. Um, and we fort fortunately, we, we got a collaboration with some people in, um, in airlines and airline pilot associations. And so we were able to do the following. And I know I, I, I probably will need three minutes, I'm sorry. Because this is, if, if, you, if, you know, if you notice, you don't have in your axis, you don't have units, okay? And there's a reason for that. Um, if you are aware um, of any, um, or have people in your family, it's an airline pilot or something like that. But it's um, very difficult to get statistics out of, um, airline companies. Um, and it's difficult enough um, 